Introduction to the importance of AI in agriculture. Hey everyone, welcome to the kickoff lecture of module 2, where we will dig into the compelling reasons why AI isn't just a technological novelty in agriculture, it's a vital step forward. You see, agriculture is as old as human civilization itself, but it also faces 21st century challenges that are making it even more complicated than ever. The state of modern agriculture food security. So we are looking at a world population that's estimated to skyrocket to nearly 10 billion people by 2050. So the puzzle we've got to solve now is how do we grow more food but with fewer resources? Environmental impact. The flip side of traditional farming practices includes soil degradation, water scarcity, and deforestation. The need for more sustainable farming isn't just an aspiration. It's crucial. Labor and capital. Don't forget, farming isn't a walk in the park, and it demands substantial capital investment, especially for machinery and other resources. And yet, the profit margins, often they are razor thin. Why AI is crucial? Number one is efficiency. So AI has this uncanny ability to juggle multiple tasks, crunch enormous data sets, and deliver insights that make farming far more efficient. Then there's precision. Because of tech like computer vision and machine learning, which are the superheroes of precision agriculture, so these guys allow us to allocate resources like water and fertilizer with laser focus accuracy. There's also predictive analysis, so imagine the capability to foresee weather changes, potential pest attacks, and even crop yields. That's AI for you. We also have accessibility, so with the advent of IoT devices and cloud-based solutions, AI isn't just for the big players anymore. So even small-scale farmers can jump on the train. Large language models. So here's where it gets sci-fi level cool. So advanced large language models like OpenAI's ChatGPT 4 and Llama 2 models are reshaping the interaction that we have with agricultural data. They can read and sift through and analyze tons of research papers, translate that into actionable advice, and even mash together with other AI tech for integrated solutions. So to wrap things up, we've just scratched the surface of why AI is a non-negotiable in tackling the multifaceted issues in today's agriculture. As we go deeper into this module, you'll get up close with the various AI technologies that promise to make agriculture not just more efficient, but also more sustainable, as well as resilient. So in the next lectures to come, we are diving into the nitty gritty subsets of AI like machine learning, computer vision, IoT, blockchain, and of course, large language models. We'll explore how these technologies are actively reshaping the landscape of agriculture, addressing real problems with high-tech solutions. So stick around, it's gonna be a fascinating journey. By the way, we have just launched Augmented AI University, which is an academy for AI visionaries and innovators. So once you join Augmented AI University, you'll learn cutting edge AI, everything from computer vision to large language models, to building rag chatbots, AI in trading, edge AI, drone robotics, and generative AI. We are launching a limited time offer where you can enroll for just $12 a month and you'll gain access to all of these cutting edge courses. So click the link down below to enroll in Augmented AI University. Today, we'll focus on the integral role of machine learning in the realm of artificial intelligence. Machine learning is a specialized technique through which computers gain the capability of learning from data and to make decisions. It serves as the backbone of many contemporary applications and its influence is particularly strong in agriculture, a sector that we'll explore in depth in future lectures. So machine learning encompasses several paradigms, each with its own set of advantages. First up is supervised learning. So this utilizes label data to create predictive models for unseen and future data. There's also unsupervised learning, which employs pattern recognition and data clustering to draw inferences from unlabeled data. And then there's also reinforcement learning, which focuses on agents that can take action to maximize rewards within a specific environment. Now let's dive into the gist of the prevalent machine learning models. So there's linear regression, which is a foundational model used primarily for forecasting numerical values. Decision trees, effective for classification problems. Decision trees, just note that they are highly interpretable. Random forests, 
an ensemble method that improves upon decision trees, offering better accuracy. And then there's the popular support vector machines or SVMs, which are excelling in classification tasks, particularly for dealing with complex data structures. Our favorite, artificial neural networks. Inspired by biological neural networks, these are key to many advancements in deep learning. And if you also wish to gain a comprehensive insight into all of these models, I invite you to visit our Augmented Startups YouTube channel, where we offer comprehensive free courses that, that range from linear regression to more advanced topics like convolutional neural networks, hierarchical clustering, and even artificial neural networks. We've got a whole playlist on it. So machine learning has a broad range of applications in agriculture, from optimizing crop yields to weather predictions. We'll expand on this compelling intersection in later lectures. Cool, next up we'll explore computer vision, which is another vital technology that complements machine learning to yield groundbreaking innovations. See you there. So today's lecture is on a topic that's often buzzed about very often, but seldom fully understood. What is artificial intelligence? That's what we'll be delving into in this lecture. So if you're already familiar with the concepts of AI, feel free to navigate to later lectures. But if you are new to the understanding of AI and how it will revolutionize agriculture, then you're in the right place, my friend. The basics of AI. First, let's dive into the definitions of artificial intelligence, which is a multidisciplinary field that enables systems to perform tasks requiring human intelligence. So this could be in the form of understanding languages, recognizing patterns and images, to making decisions and predictions. Essentially, AI tries to make machines smart, yet in a very specialized way. Types of AI. There are two types of AI, narrow and general AI. Narrow or weak AI, this is the AI that we encounter daily. It's designed and trained to perform specific tasks without possessing emotional intelligence. That's of course until Skynet takes over. <laughs> General or strong AI. Now this is the AI of the future. Still in theoretical or experimental stages, I think. Most say that it's still in theoretical or experimental stages, but who knows? This type would have the cognitive abilities of a human being, capable of understanding, learning, and applying knowledge in different domains. Components of AI. So artificial intelligence is a blend of several things, algorithms, so these are the sets of rules and patterns that the machine follows. Data. Without data, algorithms are just like the engine without fuel. Data trains the algorithm to make it better over time. Until we eventually have zero-shot learning models. Hardware. The actual physical components like CPUs, GPUs, neural or NPUs, and even tensor processing units or TPUs. So these processes handle all of the computational heaviness. A brief history of AI. So the term AI was first coined in the 1950s, but it wasn't until the 80s that machine learning came into play, allowing computers to adapt and learn from data. Fast forward to the last decade and deep learning inspired by the structure and functions of the brain has been the catalyst for AI's exponential growth. So why AI in agriculture? Well, we'll delve into AI's role in agriculture in later lectures, but for now, let's touch upon its significance. Our world faces huge agricultural challenges, be it climate unpredictability, food, security, or even efficient resource usage. AI steps in as the transformative tool that can offer scalable, data-driven solutions to these grand challenges. Also, we've gone through a comprehensive understanding of what AI is, its types, its core components, and a little sneak peek into why it's so significant in agriculture. And trust me, we're just scratching the surface. In the upcoming lectures, we'll delve into specific technologies like machine learning, large language models, such as OpenAI and Llama 2. On top of that, we'll even incorporate IoT and blockchain in the agriculture setting. So I'll see you in the next lecture. Introduction to computer vision in agriculture. Looking at my favorite topic in the whole wide world, computer vision. It plays an indispensable role in modern agriculture, particularly for tasks like real-time soil analysis, crop monitoring, as well as livestock management. So this technology provides an extra set of eyes for automation, 
which enhances productivity and efficiency. First up, we have image classification. So these algorithms are trained to categorize images into different classes. For instance, they can differentiate between healthy and diseased crops, providing critical data for farmers to take timely actions. Then my favorite, object detection. And this involves not only recognizing objects within an image, but also providing their location within the scene. This is crucial for tasks like identifying and counting the number of fruits on a tree. So when it comes to popular models, there's YOLO V8 and YOLO NAS, as well as the more recent Gold YOLO, which are the state-of-the-art choices for real-time object detection. There's also object segmentation, which involves classifying each pixel in an image, which is valuable for precision farming. For much better examples, you might need to distinguish between different types of vegetation from soil. UNET is a commonly used model for biomedical applications, but can also be used in this setting. And that is amongst other models like DeepLab V3. Surprisingly, newer versions of YOLO, like YOLO V7 and V8, can also handle these tasks. And if you haven't already, at Augmented Startups, we have comprehensive courses on the aforementioned technologies, like YOLO V3 to V8, as well as UNIT. Then there's SAM, the Segment Anything model. So SAM from Meta, I think is very cool, mainly because it introduces a novel approach offering zero-shot, promptable segmentation. So what's really exciting about SAM is that it eliminates the need for complex polygon annotations. So you can simply provide a bounding box from this point to that point during inference, and SAM will output a precise segmentation mask. Pretty cool, right? So this dramatically simplifies the segmentation process. So depth has a unique role, especially in tasks that involve movement and navigation. It's vital for automating machinery like tractors and drones, ensuring that they can accurately gauge the distance between objects and move efficiently in a 3D space. So we've used depth perception on our Raspberry Pi drone project that uses the OpenCV AI kit or OD cameras that provides AI depth perception. I'll have all of the links down to that if you'd like to check it out. The Internet of Things or IoT is an essential component in modern agriculture, moving the sector from traditional methods to a more automated and smart farming approach. So with IoT, farmers can optimize processes and manage resources much more efficiently and maximize yields. Sensors are at the core of IoT in agriculture monitoring, everything from soil moisture levels to livestock movements. So these sensors can even detect early signs of plant diseases. The collected data then can be transmitted in real time for immediate analysis and action. Smart irrigation. So with smart irrigation systems, IoT enables automated water supplies based on the needs of the individual crops. Sensors and predictive algorithms collaborate to provide optimal watering schedules, reducing waste and maximizing efficiency. So IoT integrated drones are emerging as powerful tools for tasks such as aerial mapping, planting, and even pesticide spraying. Sick, right? They offer unparalleled levels of precision and efficiency that manual labor can't even touch. Next up, real-time monitoring. So IoT technology allows farmers to benefit from real-time updates on a variety of metrics such as weather conditions, crop health, and equipment performance. This data is crucial for making timely and informed decisions. There's also data analytics. Beyond data collection, IoT employs data analytics to turn raw data into actionable insights. Machine learning algorithms can sift through enormous datasets to provide forecasts, detect anomalies, and even predict equipment failures. Automation and future developments. So as IoT technology continues to evolve, Automation in agriculture will likely become more advanced. Emerging technologies like 5G can further enhance real-time monitoring and control capabilities. Just a side note, in this course, we won't be diving particularly into the development or programming of IoT devices as that would be information overload and would also be a course on its own. Instead, we'll focus on making sense of the IoT data, which will be provided in the applications part of this course. Cool, so onwards to the next lecture. Large language models or LLMs. So the use of large language models or LLMs in agriculture is a relatively new area of exploration. 
the potential applications are immense and incredibly promising. So how LLMs can be used in agriculture? For instance, ChatGPT from OpenAI could be deployed as a conversational agent to guide farmers through troubleshooting issues, providing real-time solutions for problems such as pest control, irrigation management, and more to offer insights on optimal farming practices, making research much more accessible to farmers, and in different languages, of course. So open source and commercial models. So while ChatGPT is a well-known commercial model, there are other options as well, such as Meta's Llama 2 models and Falcon models, amongst many others. So these models are trained on 2 trillion tokens and have doubled the context length of their predecessor, Llama 1. So notably, the Llama 2 models have been optimized for a variety of natural language generation tasks, from chat-based applications to coding. So the technical edge of Llama 2. If you look at the architecture of Llama 2, it incorporates advanced methods like rotary positional embedding or rope encoding, allowing for much more efficient and accurate responses. Through continual training and human feedback, Llama 2 has been shown to outperform other leading models, including OpenAI's GPT 3.5 Turbo. And this is in various benchmarks, still waiting on benchmarks against GPT 4 at the time of this recording. So this highlights the competitive edge of open source models in the rapidly evolving field of LLMs. I would possibly use the Llama models if your application focuses more on privacy and security. Now moving on to Langchain. So what is Langchain? Langchain is like a toolbox for people who want to use language models. So you know those computer programs that understand and generate human language? Yep, those. So this toolbox makes it much easier for those developers to use these language models by offering pre-made sets of tools for these specific jobs. For example, like building chatbots or analyzing data. It's designed to make the more complicated stuff simpler so you can focus on what you want to do. So how does Langchain complement LLMs? Well, think of LLMs as the engines that are really good at understanding and using human language. Now, Langchain is like the car built around that engine. It helps you use that engine for practical things like creating apps that can chat with people or analyze text. So Langchain takes the raw power of these large language models or language engines and makes it easier for them to apply them in the real world. It helps you bridge your LLMs to your database, to your internet sources, and to the super large PDFs that you know you use as your knowledge base. Langchain and agriculture. So in the context of agriculture, Langchain can serve as the backbone for developing intelligent chatbots that can assist farmers in real-time decision-making or even automate specific tasks based on the analysis of natural language data. Then we go on to embed chain. So this is a wrapper. So we'll be using Langchain's embed chain wrapper to seamlessly integrate models like OpenAI's ChatGPT as well as Meta's Llama 2 models. So this wrapper significantly simplifies the interaction between LLMs and other components such as databases and documents. I found that it can significantly reduce the number of lines of code for a simple chatbot. So in upcoming projects in this course, Excitingly, we'll be developing several large language model driven chatbots specifically designed for the agriculture setting. So these chatbots will harness the power of both OpenAI and Llama 2 models, all neatly integrated using Langchain with the Embed Chain wrapper. So in summary, Langchain offers a versatile framework that enables us to harness the full power and potential of large language models in agriculture you'll see that it'll help us fill the gap between the raw data with actionable insights. So if you wish to dive deeper into Langchain, we actually have a comprehensive Langchain applications course, and this is available on Augmented Startups. So I'm really excited about the upcoming hands-on projects where you'll get to apply these concepts yourself. That, however, is in module three. We'll be getting there soon. But for now, next lecture, we shall look at identifying the key issues in agriculture. Lecture 2.3.1 Identifying Key Issues in Agriculture To truly grasp the complexities and challenges in the world of agriculture, we're going to do something a little different today. I'm going to tell you a little story of a farmer. Let's call him Joe. 
It's a crisp morning and Farmer Joe wakes up before the crack of dawn. The rooster hasn't even crowed yet, but Joe knows that he has a long day ahead of him. Resource Scarcity Joe heads out to his field, only to find that the irrigation system hasn't been as effective as he had hoped. The pond that used to be the lifeline of his crops is almost dry, a stark reminder of the water scarcity his region faces. Climate Change As he's pondering over this, Joe looks up at the sky. Dark clouds loom ominously over the horizon. Weather reports had forecasted a sunny day, but the climate has changed, making the weather patterns incredibly unpredictable. Pest and Disease Management Walking a bit further, Joe discovers some of his crops have been afflicted by pests overnight. He strongly considers using pesticides, but he hesitates. He knows that these chemicals can degrade the soil and harm the earthworms and bees, which are essential for the ecosystem, never mind health benefits for you and me. Labor shortages. Suddenly, Joe's phone rings. It's a text from one of his farmhands, informing him that they can't come to work today due to an illness. Labor is very hard to come by these days, and Joe can't afford any delays. Data management. His phone buzzes again. This time, it's from an alert from his IoT devices, scattered all around his farm. So these sensors have however been collecting data on soil moisture, temperature and more. Joe is inundated with this data, but doesn't have a straightforward way to interpret it for actionable insights. Supply chain inefficiencies. Finally, Joe heads to his storage facility, hoping to send off the produce that he has harvested yesterday to a local market. But due to the lack of real-time tracking and poor logistics, the produce hasn't been moved. And I know what you must be thinking, the clock is ticking. Fruits and vegetables can't wait, they might go off. The economic challenges. Joe does some quick calculations and realizes that even if he manages to get a good yield, the prices offered by the middleman barely cover his operational costs, let alone provide for his family. So as the sun sets on another exhausting day, Joe wonders how technology could make life easier for farmers like him. In this course, we'll explore how advancements like AI can provide solutions to each of these problems that Joe faces. So why am I telling you the story? Well, by understanding Joe's story, you'll gain an intimate look into the realities and difficulties that our agriculture systems are up against. But the good news is technology offers a glimmer of hope to mitigate these challenges. So let's check that out in the next lecture. Lecture 2.3.2 So in the last lecture, we journeyed through a day in the life of Joe, a man plagued by the challenges that agriculture presents today. But now let's imagine a different scenario, a better one. A day where Joe has implemented cutting-edge AI solutions, maybe even the ones from augmented startups. A new dawn. Joe wakes up to another early morning, but this time, something is different. His phone chimes with a daily weather forecast and a soil condition report, thanks to an AI-driven weather and soil analytics tool. Tackling resource scarcity. So his AI-optimized irrigation system kicks in distributing water only to where it's needed. So this system enabled by AI sensors and machine learning algorithms ensures maximum water conservation. The pond that was nearly empty is now sustaining at a stable level. Battling climate change. Although the sky has the same ominous clouds, Joe is not worried. His weather prediction tool powered by AI of course, has already foreseen this. It automatically adjusted his irrigation and even sent out drones to cover some of the more delicate crops with a protective layer. Managing Pests and Disease As he walks through his fields, Joe notices that the previous pest issues have drastically reduced. This is because he has deployed a computer vision based pest detection system. Drones equipped with computer vision technology scan his field daily and precisely apply eco-friendly pesticides only to where it's needed. Addressing labor shortages. When one of his farmlands calls in sick, Joe simply activates his automated harvesters. 
these AI-powered machines have been trained to carefully pick produce without damaging them, effectively filling in for the absent human labor. Just a side note, we do have a lecture that talks about AI stealing jobs as well as the ethics involved, but for now, let's get back to the story. Making sense of the data through LLMs. So here's where things get interesting. Joe's phone sends a message, prompting him to consult with his new AI assistant for a daily summary. Utilizing Langchain, the assistant is a fine-tuned large language model powered by either OpenAI's JetGPT4 or a Llama2 model, connected directly to his farm's data. Joe chats with the assistant, asking specific questions and receives comprehensible and actionable advice in return. The assistant even interprets raw numbers to actionable steps, providing a streamlined decision-making process that Joe finds invaluable. It's like his own agricultural expert in his pocket. Improving supply chain efficiency. The once stagnant supply chain is now a thing of the past. His new tech has helped Joe implement an AI-powered logistics solution that provides real-time tracking and optimizes routes for produce delivery. No more delays and no more wasted produce. Economic sustainability. Joe is also equipped with an AI-enabled market intelligence tool. It keeps him updated on the market demand and pricing trends, allowing him to sell his produce at the best possible price. Joe can now not only cover his operational costs, but also invest in expanding his farm. As Joe reflects on the transformation, he quickly realizes the power of technology in making his life so much more easier and his farm far more sustainable. It's been a sea of change and it's all thanks to some of the cutting edge AI and tech solutions. So as you can see, technology has the potential to turn around the harsh realities that many farmers face today. So stay tuned and we'll delve deeper into each of these technologies and also explore how you can implement them in your own scenarios. Lecture 2.4.1 The ultimate goals of using AI in agriculture. So why do we really need AI in farming? Well, it's because farming today has a bunch of challenges and AI can help fix them in fatal ways. Here's how. Getting more done but less. AI lets you control tiny things like how wet the soil is or how deep to plant seeds, helping you to get more crops. Robots and drones can do a lot of the work, which is great when there's not enough help on the farm. They can even work around the clock, unlike you and me. I don't know about you, but I need at least 8 hours of sleep to even function. Being kind to the planet. AI can figure out the best amount of water or fertilizer to use, so we waste less. It can also predict the weather, helping farmers prepare for storms or even droughts. Making even more money. AI can look at what people are buying and help farmers set the best prices. It can also make the whole process of getting food from the farm to your plate much more efficient, which saves money. Making smarter choices. AI tools like OpenAI's GPT-4 or Llama2 models can go through a lot of information and give farmers good advice in a short amount of time. These tools can even warn farmers about bad things that might happen, like diseases in their crops or problems in their livestock. They can even ask questions powered by computer vision and data, of course, like how is my herd of cattle doing? And the LLM can respond with, Jake and Robert are healthy today and quite active as well. But Sarah, on the other hand, that cow has been lazing around the whole week. Better check up on her. I mean, if she's not sick or anything like that. Keeping food safe. So AI can keep an eye on food to make sure that it's good quality and also safe to eat. It can also track where the food came from so we know it's safe. Helping the community. When farms do well, it's good for everyone in the area. AI also helps farmers learn new skills, making them even better at their jobs. So all in all, AI in farming isn't just about cool gadgets. It's about solving real world problems that make life better for farmers and everyone else who eats food. And by doing that, we are making sure that there's enough food for everyone in the future. Lecture 2.4.2 Real World Applications and Case Studies The theoretical advantages of incorporating AI into agriculture are well understood. But it's in the world of real world applications where these benefits truly come to life. Let's delve into some of the noteworthy case studies and applications that have revolutionized the agriculture sector. Precision Agriculture, 
John Deere's AI powered tractors. So these autonomous or semi-autonomous tractors are equipped with GPS, IoT sensors and AI algorithms which can make real-time decisions about planting, depth, spacing as well as irrigation. Blue Rivers See and Spray This AI powered sprayer uses machine vision to differentiate between crops and weeds, spraying only the weeds and thereby reducing herbicide usage by up to 90%. Drone Technology Aerovironment Quantics Drone so this is designed for agricultural use, of course. So these drones can survey an entire field in just a few minutes, collecting data that can be analyzed for health assessment and even irrigation planning. Drone deploys field scanner. So this technology offers real-time mapping, enabling immediate insights into plant health, hydration, and pest pressure. Environmental sustainability, IBM Watson's decision platform for agriculture. So this integrates AI, weather data, IoT, and blockchain to provide comprehensive solutions for farmers, from seed planting advice to yield predictions. Wow, people are still using IBM Watson. XAG's P-Series plant protection. So this uses AI to monitor the environmental impact of farming practices while helping farmers to make sustainable choices. Supply chain optimization. So AG shifts Hydra. This is an AI-powered food inspection system, ensuring quality and compliance with safety standards. It can analyze thousands of berries or nuts in just a minute, making the supply chain much more efficient. Gain this facial recognition. Utilized in livestock management, it identifies individual animals based on facial features and keeps track of key health indicators. Data analysis and decision support. Farm Waste Decision Engine. So this platform uses AI to collate data from various sources, making it easier for farmers to make informed decisions. Farm Traces Farm Management Software. So this uses AI to analyze operational, financial, and agronomic data at scale, offering recommendations on everything from planting to harvest. By the way, a special shout out to how OpenAI and Llama2 helps farmers. So we have helpful chatbots, right? So these are like super smart helpers that use OpenAI or Llama 2 models like how we spoke about before, but to help farmers understand the data and also give solid advice. So imagine a chatbot that can tell you what crops to plant based on the weather forecast and so much more. Connecting the dots. So these chatbots can also be linked to all of the information a farmer already has so that they can take the confusing data and turn it into something useful. So in short, AI like OpenAI's GPT models, bridged together with Langchain, with the embed chain wrap of course, can really shake things up in my opinion within the farming industry. It can help with everything from doing the boring stuff to making smarter choices based on facts. And all of this from my perspective will make farming much more better around the world. And that's what we'll teach in this course in later modules. Lecture 2.5.1 Challenges and Ethical Questions in using AI in farming. So as we stand on the edge of a farming revolution driven by AI, it's important to think about the unexpected problems that could arise. This isn't about glitches in technology. We're talking about a wide range of issues from keeping data safe to the impact on local communities. Let's dive into some of these big questions. Keeping data safe. First, let's talk about data because it's becoming a valuable resource for farmers, but who really owns this information? And with the rise of hacking, how do we keep this data safe? Both technology and laws need to get better at protecting us. Llama, Hugging Face, and Falcon LLM models are open source. So that's only if you don't want to go through the open AI route. Jobs, what's the trade-off? AI can do a lot to help farmers, but what happens to the workers who lose their jobs because of automation? It's important to think about the people who are affected as we adopt these new tools. Big companies taking over. Next, let's talk about the risk of big companies dominating the market. As major agriculture companies invest in AI, we have to be careful that they don't end up controlling the entire industry. Social impact, good or bad. Another concern is how AI affects communities. High-tech tools might be expensive for small farmers, making life even harder for them. 
Also, what happens to traditional farming methods that have been around for ages? The environment, help or harm? AI promises to make farming far more efficient, but there's a downside. These systems use a lot of energy and could actually harm the environment. So we need to make sure that the technology is truly sustainable. Ethical questions. It's complicated when it comes to ethics. Things get tricky. Lines get blurred real quick. Could AI systems make social inequality and even bias worse? And let's not forget that we have ethical responsibilities to the animals that we farm too. So who makes the rules? Lastly, we need to think about regulation. Right now, there's not much global rules out there on how AI should be used in farming. So this could lead to some serious problems if we are not careful. I myself have joined the newly formed South African AI Association or SAAIA. And this is all about responsible and ethical uses of AI. Because while I believe that we need to be as innovative as possible, we should also do so responsibly. And in conclusion, using AI in farming comes with a lot of promise, but also a lot of questions that we need to be answered. Like they say, with great power comes great responsibility. I just hope you're not killing any spiders, confusing them with pests. Anyway, it's crucial that we think about these challenges now so that we can build a farming industry that's both advanced and fair for everyone. Lecture 2.5.2 Future Trends and Predictions in AI-Driven Agriculture So as we think about the future of AI in agriculture, there are several exciting trends and predictions we should keep our eyes on. From drones mapping out entire fields to AI-powered systems providing real-time advice to farmers, the possibilities are almost endless. But what's likely to actually happen? Let's delve into what's coming down the pipeline. Intelligent farming systems. First up, intelligent farming systems are expected to get even smarter. We're talking about AI systems that can learn and adapt to specific farming conditions, making decisions at almost if they were the expert farmers themselves. Data-driven insights. So data is king, and this won't change anytime soon. We also have advanced analytics tools, which will likely become a more common place, providing farmers with even deeper insights into their operations. So this could range from soil health to predicting the best time to plant and harvest. There's also hyper-local weather predictions. So weather has always been a big deal in farming, and AI is set to make weather predictions even more accurate than ever. Imagine knowing the exact right moment to harvest because your AI system forecasts a rainstorm down to the minute. And maybe even to the centimeter, who knows? Robotics and automation. So we've already seen some automation in farming, but expect this trend to explode. Drones and automated tractors will become more sophisticated, able to handle more tasks thereby reducing the need for human labor in some aspects. Eco-friendly tech. Environmental concerns aren't going away. That's why the future of AI technologies will likely focus on sustainability. We are looking at energy efficient systems and AI algorithms that can help reduce the use of water and chemicals. Personalized farming. Last but not least, Think about personalized farming experiences. AI could offer custom, tailored advice to each farmer, taking into account their unique circumstances from the type of soil they have to their specific farming goals. Regulatory changes. So as we touched on, the issue of regulation is a big one. As AI farming matures, we can expect new laws to help govern its use. It's important to ensure that the technology is used in a safe and ethical manner, like we discussed in the last lecture. Future impact of advanced LLMs and multimodal AI in agriculture. So as we look ahead, the evolution of large language models, maybe even like GPT-5 or 6, or even Llama 3 or 4 or 10, who knows, promises transformative changes in agriculture. Additionally, the rise of multimodal AI, which combines text, vision, and possibly other sensor data, which will further amplify these impacts. Smarter agricultural advisors. 
So the future LLMs could serve as voice activated in-field consultants, offering real-time data-driven advice that's even more precise thanks to multimodal inputs like satellite imagery and sensor data. Zero-shot learning in computer vision. So LLMs integrated with computer vision technologies can enable zero-shot learning. It's a current reality, but with a simple description from a farmer, these multimodal systems could perform instant image recognition. No need for extensive datasets. The synergy of language and vision could be a game changer for identifying new pests, crops, diseases, or even optimal soil conditions. Enhanced crop science. So advanced LLMs could act as virtual crop scientists, coupling text-based advice with real-time visual and sensor-based data analysis. I think that will be pretty cool. So this multimodal approach could provide a much more nuanced and tailored recommendation on soil, weather, and other environmental conditions. Global knowledge sharing. So this is a big one. So as LLMs grow more multilingual and multimodal, they'll democratize access to expert agricultural advice, breaking down language barriers and incorporating a diverse range of data inputs. This could have a profound effect on equipping small-scale farmers around the world who do not natively speak English. And this is with the knowledge and tools that they need. The power of multimodal AI. So perhaps one of the most compelling future trends is the full integration of a multimodal AI into agriculture. So this means that AI systems won't just understand text or images alone, but will synthesize information from various sources to provide much more comprehensive and accurate insights. This level of interconnected reasoning will revolutionize the decision-making process in agriculture. So in conclusion, the synergy of advanced LLMs, computer vision, and multimodal AI is supposed to bring about substantial shifts in agricultural efficiency, sustainability, and equity. Welcome to this lecture series on Crop Disease Identification Act. In this project, we are going to develop an application where a user can upload an image so the image can be of a plant which has a certain disease. We have integrated an object detection model which would detect what kind of disease the plant has. Once we receive the label of disease from the object detection model, we will parse it to a large language model, specifically OpenAI GPT 3.5 model. Here, we have created a default prompt template using LangChain. We send that prompt to ChatGPT asking for information about what the next step is or the next step that should be taken to rectify the disease and to know more about the disease. Next the large language model will give us a response accordingly. So this is the basic structure of the application. Now, let's see the application in action. Here, I can upload a picture. Let's see, this is a test image. Let's upload the image and we'll process it afterwards. Here, we can see the object detection model has identified that this is a tomato leaf. This is the detected disease. Here, you can see we have the disease name. Okay, so Jack would ask, how can we assist you? So we can ask him, what can I do to get rid of this disease? As you can see, the chatbot replied with a full step mechanism to adapt in order to get rid of this disease. So it provides us several steps to take. It says, starts by removing any infected leaves or plants from the area and make sure to water your plants at the base rather than overhead. Avoid overcrowding your tomato plants, so on and so forth. You may continue this chart zone to get better information on how to get rid of this disease. This is a basic preview of this application. This application has been built using React on the front end, and then we have connected it with the back end using Flask APIs. On the back end, we are using LangChain to connect with the large language model. Similarly, we are using Yolo version 8 to perform the inference on the image. So this is the very basic overview of the application that we are going to build in this lecture series. First of all, we are going to train our object detection model that detects different kinds of diseases given the image of a plant. So this is the data set that we are going to use. This is the plant doc image data set, which is available open source on RoboFlow. So if we do a quick health check of this data set, here you can see that we have 30 classes and 2600 images. We can see which classes are overrepresented and which are underrepresented. You can see here all the information about the data set. So we will use this data set. You can click on the download data set button and then click on the show download code. 
you can select the format from here. Now, you will be using the yellow version 8 format. Then press on the continue button and just simply copy this code. Now, we will open a Google Collab notebook. Then we will simply paste this code here. So we have it right here. Let me run this cell. As you can see, this is downloading the data set into the session of our collab notebook. And you can see that we have the data set right here. All right. Now, what we can do is in order to train the yellow version 8 model on the custom data set, we have to first install Ultra Elytics. Okay. One point of consideration here is when you will run this notebook for the first time, you might see something like you have to restart your kernel or your collab session. So just click this and that will restart your session. And don't worry, this will not result in losing your data. The session and the data will still be there. Now, we're going to install Ultralytics. Once we have installed Ultralytics, we can already write the code that we will use to train the YOLO version 8 model on this custom data set. So let's first import YOLO from Ultralytics. Then let's put model is equal to YOLO. So we use the YOLO version 8 nano model. We define it here. Now we will simply train the model so that will be model.train. Then we will parse the source, the path to the data file in this folder, and we can adjust the number of epochs that we want to train. We will train for 100 epochs. Similarly, you can set the batch size. Let's say we set it to 16. So this will basically train our model. One change that we might need to make is this. You open this data.yaml file. You might want to change the path of the custom trained images here because I noticed that you might run into some errors when trying to train by simply using the default data.yaml file you are given by RoboFlow. So you just copy the path of this folder and paste it right here. Let me do this and do the same thing here. Okay, so it's done and that should do it. We'll just save this file and copy the path of this data.yaml file and paste it here. Now you can just run this. Okay. I think if you check here, this is not pointing to the right folder. So let me just stop the script right here. Let's see the data.yaml file again. So the train folder, the validation folder is here. Ah, there's the problem here. Okay. So. It's not source is equal to, but should be data equals plant doc data dot y a m l. So that was a mistake. So that's okay now. Now it has read the right image for training, and the training process has begun. Let's wait until the model is trained. All right, since I have already trained the model beforehand, I'm just going to stop the training process right here, but you can let it continue for all the 100 epochs. So let's stop it right here. These are basically the weights best.pt that I gained after training it for 100 epochs. So once you let it finish for 100 epochs, you can find the weights and the runs folder in the detect folder where you will find this. Whichever is the latest train folder, you can simply go to that folder. There will be a weights folder and you can find the best.pt weights right here. You can download them and save them into your drive or whatever you want. So these are the weights that you will be using for your case. But since I have already trained the model, these are the weights that I have trained on this data set. So let's quickly test these weights to see how well they are performing. I will simply do this. I would create a new instance of the yellow class, but this time I will parse the path of the best weights. In this case, that will be best.pt right here. But in your case, the weights will probably be somewhere right here in the latest train folder. And in the weights folder, you will find the weights right here, the best.pt weights. So you will simply parse the path to these weights. Once we are done, we will be able to run this model on all test images. So let's put results is equal to model.predict. Here we will parse a parameter source equals to the path to the text images. So let me copy the path and paste it right here. We will also save the results. We will put save equals true. And similarly, 
I would parse another parameter string equals true. And we could do for result in results, pass, and let's run the cell. Okay, we can add a slash here as well. So it's not the test folder, but test slash images. Okay, with this, let's run the cell. As you can see, we are performing inference on all the test images and the results of this inference will be stored again in the runs folder. Click detect. Here you see a folder named detect where you can see all the images. If I were to open one of these images, you will see the detection results. I can click on another image too. So as you can see, the model is performing on test images. Please download the best.pt weights because we are going to do the rest of the work locally. You can also train the model on your local machine if you have a good GPU or a good CPU because that might also work. But in case you don't have access to a good CPU or GPU, you can always use Collab. The next steps now will be to create the back end of our application, which will consist of running the model on an image and then passing the results of the inference to the large language model using lane chain, along with some kind of prompt to get information about the disease or how to rectify it, or if you want to know more things about the disease. So this video is all about training a YOLO version 8 model on a custom data set. We use this data set on RoboFlow, the plant or chemist data set, to train our custom YOLO version 8 model. Now we have the best weights and we will integrate them into our application. In this video, we will work on the back end of this application. As you may guess, there are two parts in the back end of this application. The first part is getting the inference from the object detection model that we have trained. So when a user uploads an image on this app, we will perform inference on this app using the object detection model. The results of this inference will be parsed to a large language model, which is the second part of the back end. So let's first implement this part where we perform inference on a given image, and then we will work on developing the element part of the application. Afterwards, we will combine them together and we will basically make a Flask API which we can access the results of these influences. First of all, you will have to make two folders for your application. The first one being a folder where to save the files for the front end, and the second one will be the folder where you can save your back end files. Once you have created these folders, you can open the backend folder and create two other folders named assets where you will store the weights, YOLO, the weight that we have fine tuned, and the best.pt file here. In the script, we will add an inference.py file and the chat.py file which we'll work on later. We will also create an application.py file where we will write the code to build the Flask API. But let's first work on the inference only, but before you get started, one important thing is to set up your environment for this application. So I'm using virtual environment. I have created a virtual environment named disease detection. You can also work with conda environments if you are more comfortable with them. Once you have created an environment, one important consideration is to always keep the Python version to be greater than or equal to 3.9 whenever you are working with large language models. So, you have to use Python version to be greater than or equal to 3.9. Once you have done that, we'll be needing several things in this application. The first one, of course, is we have to install Ultralytics since we are building our application from the point where we are performing inference on an image. Let's first install Ultralytics. So once we have done that, we can write the code for inference at least. Here, we first of all import YOLO from Ultralytics and also import NumPy as MP. We will simply write a function called inference. It will receive an image and it will simply give us the results. We will have to initialize a model. So the model is equal to YOLO access backslash best.pt. This will initialize our model. In order to get the results, we will simply parse the image to the model and we can also set a confidence parameter. Let's adjust it to 0.4. Then I will create a NumPy matrix with the same dimension as that of the image, but store only zeros. The reason why we are doing this is that we want to save the results of the inference in this image. Also, we will be using the names of the classes on which our model is trained and the names of the classes which are present inside the image. 
So the class's dictionary will contain all the names and the names in which our model is trained. The names underscore info will simply contain all the classes that are actually present inside a given image. Let me do something here. For R and results, infer is equal to R dot plot. This will simply overwrite the image. So using the dot function, you get the bounding boxes and the label of the class forms the image. You don't have to separately draw the bounding boxes and so on and so forth. This is the reason why we have just initialized infer as a numpy array beforehand. And then we simply store the results of the r.plot function in the infer array. Then we read the names of all the classes which are in the art of names and the names infer list will be equal to r.boxes. We get all the boxes object inside the given result and the classes corresponding to those boxes. And then we just come into the list. So now we have all the things that we need and we can return all this information. Then return infer names, infer classes, and maybe let's test the last one. Okay? When I make a mistake, we have to return these outside the for loop. So let's fix this. Now, our function is good to go. The change and name of the function to inference. Maybe we can test it out. Let me copy an image onto here. Okay, so we have saved the image. Let's test the script out, and then we have the image in the assets. All we have to do is just import CV2. And next, what we're going to do is image equals CV2. Once we have read the image, oh, oh, sorry, let me just get this information. Inference image names and classes are equal to inference.image. Then CV2, I'm show and reference inference image. We also want to print the other information as well. So print names of the classes names, then print classes present in the image. Okay, so that's correct. Let's add JPEG here and change this to I'm right. And let's run the code. All right, as you can see, we have successfully received the inference. And as you can see here, we have the names of the classes, but there's just one confusion here. I guess we'll put the text in the third class, return infer, classes names infer. Okay, so you can see the name of the classes and the images were swapped because we're returning them in the wrong order. Although we are reading them in the right order, I think we need to put classes in the data set and classes in the image. Now let's see this again. Let's add JPEG here and change this to I'm right. And let's run the code. All right, as you can see, we see the names of the following classes. These are all the label IDs and the names of the class corresponding to that. We can see that there are two classes present in the image and both have the label 20. So that would be this tomato leaf spot. And we can see the inference image here. Now we know that our inference code is running perfectly well. So we can basically move on to the chatbot part of the backend. Let me clean up this testing code since we don't really need this. We're okay now. This inference.py file has this inference function, which we can use to perform inference given an image. All right, now let's start working on the chatbot part of our application. Okay, first of all, we will need to install LangChain, OpenAI Tick Token, and I guess that's it. These are all the things that we will need for the chatbot part of the application. Let's start installing them. Once we are done, what we could do is make some imports from LangChain. So from LangChain.prompt, we will import the prompt template. And similarly, we will import chat open AI from chat models. So let's put for chat open AI. We will also import LLM chain from LangChain. Chains import LLM chain. So these are all the things that we need. We've also added the OpenAI API key. Now let's start working on building the chatbot part. First, we will create a variable to store the name of the model that we want to use. We can use GPT-3.5 Turbo, or if you have access to the GPT-4 API, you can also use GPT-4. I'm just implementing this lineup here. You can use GPT-4 if you do have access to it. Now we will create an instance of the chat OpenAI class. We will pass the model name that we are using. So model name is equal to the name and we will set the temperature of the chat bot to be 0.3. I'm not setting a very high temperature, but since this is mostly related to the information that the chat bot has to give, we don't want it to get very creative. It should just stick to the point and not start hallucinating. 
we will parse the OpenAI API key. This will create an instance of the chat OpenAI class. Now, we can basically use LangChain to get the response from the GPT 3.5 model. So let me use these functions, just the chatbot function. Next, we'll pass it some info, which is basically the dictionary that we have defined above. We will parse the history of the conversation that has been going on between a user and the chatbot. Of course, we will also parse the current message that the user has parsed. So first, find a prompt template. Now, the prompt template is going to be something like this. You are a farming expert with specialized knowledge in diseases. A farmer comes to you with the name of a specific plant disease and some basic information about it. Your job is to guide the farmer. So we will add information about the disease. We will save it in info chat history. This will be history. All right. So this is basically the prompt template that we will use and let's create a prompt template object. So prompt is equal to prompt template equals the content that we have to find above. And we tell them that the input labels are going to be info history and message. Now we can initialize an LLM chain. We parse the large language model that we are using and we have defined the large number model right here. And the prompt is equal to prompt that is defined. Now we will invoke this LLM chain. Let me write response is equal to chain dot predict info is equal to info history equals history and message is equal to message, right? This will just give us the response from the large language model and we will just return this response. All right. So this completes essentially the LLM part of the application. We are simply doing very basic prompt engineering to get our large language models to do what we want. Now we will integrate both these files, the chat.py file and the inference.py file into a class application. Here we will create the flash APIs, which will connect the inference.py file and the chat.py file with our front end, which is yet to be developed. But let's first build the flash APIs. First of all, we will need to install Flask and Flask-Cores. So we will just import them into our application. So let's put from Flask, import Flask, and also import request and JSONify. So JSONify is to return the content of any function as a JSON object. Maybe we will import cores cross region resource sharing. So from Flask underscore cores, import Cores. We will also need CV2 because we will have to convert the images that we get into base64 encoding so that we can pass it on to our front end. They will be decoding it there. Also import IO. Then we simply import the functions that we are defined in the inference.py file and the chat.py file. So there's an input function inference and chatbot. Now we will first initialize our application. So app is equal to flask. This will initialize our application. Now let's first define a function. We need to do this so that when we pass the image to this function, it returns the actual label that we want to show in the image or parse or to chat GPT. So this function is basically going to call the inference function and do a little bit of cores processing on that. We are getting info from the inference function. We have the image, we have all of the classes, the data set and the name information, which basically contains the names of the classes that are present in the image. Classes and image equals inference YOLO and parse the inference function, right? So we will have all this information. Now we convert the dictionary, the classes and the actual classes list. So classes list is equal to list. Oh, uh, sorry, not actually the classes and data set, but rather the classes in the image since there might be repetitions. So we just want to remove these repetitions. So save image classes list. Now we will have only the unique classes in this list. If you can still remember from the video, the classes and image actually contain the label IDs rather than the labels themselves. We will read the label ID from the class list and then read its actual name from the classes and data set dictionary. Also, we will have to iterate it over the length of the list and simply do this. So we learned to do that. Well, let me continue. Okay. Now we have read the labels of all the classes present inside this image and we can simply go down the label and return the inference image label. In a similar fashion to the detect function, we will also write a function that will basically handle the chatbot part. So I got chat front and then we'll parse the history of the conversation and the message, of course. 
Additionally, we will also parse the classes in the data set and the classes in the image objects. The reason why we are doing that is that we want to use this class info dictionary to get the information from the dictionary. So we will need the labels and all the actual classes. That's why we are going to pass these objects further. If you can still remember from the file, it takes info, history, and message, and we have the history and message being parsed to this function. So we don't need to worry about them. Now, what we need to do is gather the info from the class info dictionary that we have imported. So let's first define an empty string called info. And again, what we will do is we will iterate over the classes in the image data set. For each class in the image, we will get the information and populate that into the info string. Then we'll do the same thing like if X is greater than or equal to the classes in the image list. For each class in the image, we will get the information and populate that into the info string. Then we will do the same thing if, let's say, info is going to be info plus str str. So first of all, we will read the name of the class from the classes and dataset dictionary using the label ID that we have in the classes and image list. So that will be classes in the data set and we parse the current object in the classes and image list. That this will essentially give us the name of the class corresponding to the label ID. The X label ID in these classes in the image dictionary. What we're going to do is we will add a string semicolon and then string. Now this string will basically use the class info dictionary. So I would parse the name of the class. I think this is getting a little bit cluttered. so. I think I'd rather do this, name equals string classes and data set. And the key is this X. Now we have the name and we want to get the info from the class info dictionary and we will then parse the name of the class and that is a name right here. I disagree with this, so let's remove this. Whatever biggest info we have. We will simply add the current information in this format. So name plus colon and info current. All right. so. Let me take this out of the statement because we are going to need it regardless. And only in this case can we go on. So this makes a lot more sense now. So we have retrieved the information from the disease using the classes info dictionary. And now we have stored all this info into this string. Next, what we'll do is simply get the response from the chatbot. So response is equal to chatbot parts the info, the history and the message. Let me confirm if we are in the right order. Our chatbot function should be all right. I'm going to continue with this code. We have just finished a response. Also, I see that since we are not actually returning the classes and data and classes and image from this direct function, and also it might be a bit problematic to connect the detect and the chatbot function. So I think a good idea would be to make these global variables. In order to do that, what we can do is make some global variables and then store them into the global variables. So we have a label and this will be an empty list and then we'll have a dictionary class. Now what we do is simply put global labels equals to image classes list. Similarly to make the classes in the data set as global as well. So global classes is equal to classes in the data set. Now what we can do is instead of using classes in image, we are going to use labels. Let me adjust the code quickly. So that should do it. Now we can move these two from the function from the collection. Good to go. So let's move forward. I will have to define a route on which we will be sending the inferred image. So you look at it essentially at the local host backslash upload, we'll be sending this inferred image. So basically the idea is that the front end will send the image to this upload route backslash upload URL. The back end will basically perform the detection and then return the inference image along with other data to this URL. All right, so we get the image from the front end at this URL, perform inference and send it back. We will check that the file name is not empty. So if the user has some files and if it is empty, then again, we will say that we simply put return JSONify and the error this time is no selected file. Finally, this is what we're going to do if the user sends an encoded format. So we will have to decode that first. We will do this first, create an instance of the bytes IO object. So this is where we will temporarily store the image after decoding it. So file.save in memory file and the data of this file will be np.fromBuffer in memory file.getValue 
and the data type is np.unt8 and the color image flag is equal to 1. The image is equal to cv2.imdcode data color image flag. And after getting the image, we will simply go to the detected function that has been defined at form. And after getting the inference image in this variable detected image, we will now encode it back and send it a JSON object at the root slash upper. So image is encoded as going to be for cv2.imencode.jpg detected image. And now we will use base64 to encode it as a text. So image as text is equal to base64.b64 image encoded decode utf. Dash eight. Now we have the images as text and we can simply return it as a JSON object. And if there said there was some error with reading the file, we can return the following that we have to see. Type return JSONify error. The error is failed to process the image 500. So right now we have integrated the detection part, but we still need to integrate the chatbots part. For that, we will type app.route and input slash chat, and the method is post. And let's define the chat. So here, again, we will have to do some checks. So the front end will post a message from the user at this URL, and we'll get this URL, and we read the message from this URL and pass it on to the language model. If not request.json or message, not in the request.json. We say that we didn't receive any message and return JSONify error. No message provided. Now, if there was a message provided, we simply read that from the request.getJSON and the user message is going to be the data message. And we will store the chat history at the front end. So we would just send it along with the message to the chatbot in the data chat history. So this request will contain the message and chat history objects. We'll simply read them and now we will invoke the chat front function and get the bot response. So bot response is equal to the chat front function. We pass the chat history and user message. Let's see if we did that in the right order. Huh? Yes, we did. So here we go. We'll get the response, bot response, and we are simply going to JSONify it. So the text would be return JSONify response, which will be the bot response. Now our back end is ready. Once we write the code for the front end, we can test the back end along the way as well. In this video, we will go over the front end of our application. The front end has been designed in React GS. As you can see on the current screen, we have the following functionalities to implement. First of all, we have to add an option to upload an image. Then we have a process button. Upon pressing it, we will call the object detection from our back end. Afterwards, we will receive the processed image along with the bounding boxes and the classes. Similarly, we will receive the detected labels, and then we will have this chatbot right here on the right side. Then we can chat with the ChatGPT models. Let's start by building this front end. In order to create the front end of the application using React, you must ensure that we have Node installed in your system. If you have not installed Node yet, please go ahead and install Node in all packages like npx and npm. Although npx and npm mostly come bundled with Node if you follow the default installation steps. Once you're done, you may head over to the folder where we store all the code files for our application. Here, open the terminal in this folder so we can proceed. So this is the folder. I have already created the front end. Let me just quickly show you how you can do it. If we open this in the terminal, you will have to run the command npx create react app and then the name of the app. Although I have already created a front end folder, so I gave it the name front end. Let's give it a different name, however. So let's put crop disease front end. Now I will just run the command npm start. As you can see, we have a very basic front page for our application which just shows the reacting work rotating. Now we can start working on the code. So far we have successfully installed React and created our first React application. Let me just delete this since we already created a new folder for our front end. All right, now all you have to do is open VS Code or any other text editor that you use. You also need to open the crop disease folder. Here it is. 
And as you can see, it contains node modules, packages of files, a public folder which contains all your assets, and a source folder that contains the source code for this application. If I quickly show you this in Visual Studio Code, this is how it looks like in Visual Studio Code. So I have made a few changes. In the index.js file in the source folder, I have added one line, which is the import bootstrap dist css bootstrap min css, and in the index.html file, I have also included the bootstrap. I will have to do one more thing, and that is to install the bootstrap. I will do it by using the command npm install bootstrap. This will install the bootstrap in the nodes modules folder. So I'm done. Now, what I can do is run the application again using the command npm start and see how it looks like. Yeah, it's working fine. No errors in respect to the console. So it's working perfectly. Now, we can continue building on this application. The changes in the index.js and index.html file are in place. Also, we have installed Bootstrap in a node module for Bootstrap. I have made a few changes in the app.css file, so you don't need to worry about it. You can quickly go over to see the styling. Since this is not the main content of this application, you can just ignore it for now and focus on the app.js file, which is basically covering the main functionality of our application. As you can see here, we are importing the app.css file, and this is basically the default boilerplate code that was provided when we created the React application. So we'll now start editing it. Here you can see we have a functional component called app, which is basically being rendered when we run the application. This is the JXX, which is being rendered by default. Now, if I can quickly show you that, this is the HTML or the JSX space that has been rendered currently by default. Let me just remove this since we are going to implement our own functionalities. First of all, let's create a div and use the class name equals container MT-5. So this is from Bootstrap. Initially, let's add the title of our application, which is crop disease identification. Also, put the class name from the CSS that we want to add, which is text center. So I'm going to save this and let's see the changes here. We can see that the title crop disease identification has been rendered here. Essentially, how React works is that the final HTML page that is rendered is actually written in this return statement. This is the HTML that we see on our page. Now, coming to the core component of this functionality of our application, we will use the use state from React. We will import React, then use the use state quote from React. After importing the use state quote, we would define the states that we will use in this application. So first of all, we will use the image state and the function that will set the state will be set image. Let's set the initial value to null. Initially, the state contains null, the image state. Similarly, we will add some other states. So let's proceed. Another state that we will use is loading. So this will basically help us know if we are performing some sort of operation on the back end. We can give that feedback to the user on the front end. Initially, the loading would be set to false. Similarly, we will also use the processed image state that will basically store the results of the detection which will come from the back end. Again, this will also be null initially. So we will use the detected label state and initially it will also be set to null. We also need to store the messages that are sent to the back end to the chatbot and from the messages that we received from the back end. They will be set to an empty array. Of course, we need to store the user input as well. So that would be initially an empty string. Similarly, if you want to display any warning, let's put set warning and initially that will be an empty string. If let's say the backend is working on sending the messages to ChatGPT and receiving the messages back. So we want to show some sort of loading. For that, we will create a set chat loading state and it would be false. Now, these are all the states that we want to use. Basically, we can write the functions in which we'll handle various events so let's do that. 
So let's say if the user uploads an image, we will write a function called handle image change. So we read the file which has been uploaded by the user using e.target.files. We will initialize a file reader and then we will call all these states. Essentially, what we want to do is whenever a user uploads a new image, we need to reset everything. So the messages will be set to empty because if, well, let's say the user has first uploaded an image and asked questions around it, but if they upload a new image, we need to reset all the messages and essentially create a new state for everything. Now we set and clear all the states. So first of all, we set the messages to empty, set the processed image to null, and set detected label to null, and set loading will be false. And the warning message is also empty. After making all these changes, we will define reader.readAsDataURL and then we will pass the file. Then reader.onloadN when the file is loaded is equal to a function, which will basically set the image that has been uploaded by the user. So set image to reader.result. We have created the case for uploading the image. Now let's add some HTML or the JSX for it. After we have set the title, we want the image upper section to be on the left side of the page. So let me create a new div. So div class name equals app body deflex. Then I will create another div which will contain the left content of our application. So the class name will be left content. Let me just quickly add the logo here. So the image source will be backslash download.png. Essentially, we are pointing towards this file. We don't need to add the public slash down.png for this public. The assets in the public folder are at the root of the application. The class name is equal to Heather image. Now we'll add a conditional block in JSX. As you can see, this is what this block shows. It is a conditional statement that if let's say if an image is true, then do this thing, whatever it is in the parentheses. Initially, you can see that we have set the image state to null, but if the user has uploaded an image, this will be set to true. So we can show the uploaded image as a preview. So I will take the class name is equal to MT-4. Yeah, we'll add the heading and use the H3 heading. Next, we'll write the text preview. This way it will display the image and the source is going to be the image the user has uploaded. Then alt equals preview and the class name is equal to image thumbnail. So this should show the image that the user uploads. We have not yet added anything for the event handler when the image is changed. So let's have it done first. So for that, we will add a div. So this will be an empty dash for container. Then we will add an input tag so that the user can upload a file. And I will accept images and just put the class name for this tag. Class name equals form control file. And on change will be the handle image change function. As you can see, you can now upload an image. Let's see if let's say I upload this image. We can see this image being displayed right here. We have to add the functionality to call the backend. So we have to run first the backend. Here's our backend. I would have the command python app.py. The backend will start and just let this and we'll be running all this code. What we have to do is to add the functionality to process the image which has been uploaded by the user. Before writing the case for processing the image, we first need to convert the image that has been uploaded by the user into the readable format which can be sent to the backend. So that will provide a function data URL to blob equals data URL. The command will be a constant array is equal to data URL dot split where we essentially contain the data of split. So we will be splitting it to fetch the my match which is at the zero index in this array and match the following characters. Then if not my match we will throw an error that is an invalid my type. This essentially means that the image was not very successful in reading the image. So if that is successful, the mime and bootstrap usually, the functioning atop to create the length of this b string. Now we finally create the blob and return it. 
So let's put return new blob u8 array, then type mime. Now we have it in the code to convert the data URL. You want to blob. Now that we have written the function to convert the data URL to blob, we can write the handler for when the user presses the process button. Here we define a function, so let's put handle process image. What this function will do is set the loading to true. We have to find the set loading state and we will set it to true so that we give some sort of feedback to the user that we are processing the image that they have uploaded in the backend. After retrieving the data from the response, we will read the image URL and the label from the response. So let's put response.image URL is equal to data colon image backslash JPEG semicolon base64 and base64 data image. This is how we read the image URL and we set the process image state that we have defined to this image URL. Then we set the detected label using data.label and we set loading to false because now we have received the response from the backend and let's set the message. Now we can add the functionality to catch any error. Let's say if the response to JSON was not okay, we will throw an error. So console.error then insert set loading parentheses false. All right, now that we have written the handling of the case where the user has uploaded an image and pressed the process button, hence requesting the object detection model to run, we can also add one more thing. Let's say the bot has sent a dummy sort of message. Let's say, how can we assist you? So now we are just entering a conversation from the chatbot. Now we can write the HTML elements to display the process button and to show the inferred image. Okay, we are just viewing the image uploaded by the user. Here we can add a button. The button will have the class name and the class name will be equal to button button primary mt3. Then on click is equal to handle process image function. The text inside the button will be close, right? Now we can show the conditional JSX for loading. When the image is being processed by the backend, we will do this and show a spinner. We can also add the div for the spinner. So div class name is mt4. We add another div so that the class name will be spinner porter text primary and the role is equal to status. Now go ahead and change the same courses to double forms, okay? We'll do the rest of the changes later. Right now at a span, class name equals sr only, okay? and it will be loading. Then we're going to add some text saying image is being processed, okay? Now, we have the loading part. We will now show the processed image again. We'll use the similar JSX box. We'll have the condition that if we have received the processed image, then we'll display the following. So we will create a div. You show the processed image, class name equals MT4, and let's add a heading H3. And it will say processed image. The image source is going to be the processed image. The image source is going to be equal to the processed image state we have stored. And the alt text is going to be processed and the class name is image thumbnail. We will also show the detected labels under the same div. I can add a nested block of this conditional JSX code. So the detected label. We will add another div, okay? So for this, the class name is going to be MT2 and we will bold the class name. Then we added labels, the detected labels. This will show the processed image and the detected label under the image. Now let's see how the front page looks like now. Let's rerun this. Let's choose the file so we can see the process. Let's have this image. I just clicked the process button. It is now being processed. As you can see, we have received the inferenced image and the detected diseases right here. <laughs> All right, now we can start working on the chatbot, the chatbot UI on the right side of the web page. Let's do it. The image processing part of our application is complete on the front end. Now we can move on to the chatbot part. Now we kind of need a handler to handle the case when the user sends a message, so let's continue. Let's get a handle send message. Let's put handle send message. If the user input dot trim is equal to an empty string, that is when the user hasn't actually typed out anything 
and you just press the enter button or click on the send button. We are going to set the warning to press enter a message to let the user know that they haven't entered any message. We will set a timeout for this warning to remove it. The second warning will be set to an empty string. So the warning state will be set to an empty string after 2000 milliseconds or two seconds. <laughs> then we will simply return. If the user has actually entered something, we will have to set chat loading to true. Now the payload that will be sent to the back end will be this. The message will be user input and the chat history. As you can see here, we have used the set messages to set the state of the message right here. Now we send the history, which is messages object as well to the back end. Next, we'll make an API call to the URL on which we are calling the back end. So slash chat as the URL where we have deployed our chatbot. The method is post and the header of this API call is going to be the content type application JSON. The body of this API call is going to be json.stringify parentheses payload. Now we have defined the API call that will be made to the backend. Now let's have the response. We will get the JSON object from the response. Then inside the data that we have retrieved from the JSON object, we will use the text messages functions to set the messages state to basically upgrade the messages and to set the chat loading and to give any sort of errors. We'll set the messages and we are going to be setting messages. First of all, the sender is user and they have entered the text, which is user input. Then the sender is bot and the text is data.response. After this successful API call, we can set the user input to empty now. Set the user input into an empty string and set warning into an empty string. We also need to find a handle send message. We will also add a function handle key press. So in case the user presses the enter button instead of clicking the send button on the screen, let's add the area over there. So handle key presses. If one key is equal to enter, call the handle send message button as the handle send message function. Now we will add the UI for the chatbot implementation. So for that, we will do it in a write content div. So let's create a new div for the write content. The class name is write content and now we created it for the chatbot. So my class name is chatbox. For each message in the messages, you write a function. So for that, we will use the SD sure. Here's the script with the times and number placements removed and the sentences structured together. Now go ahead and change the same courses to double forms, okay? We will do the rest of the changes later. Right now, at a span, class name equals SR only. The class name for this element is warning message and the text will be seen in the warning state. To have warning, we will display the paragraph. So the class name for this element is warning message and the text will seem to be in the warning state. The input type is of course going to be text and the value be stored any value and in user input. Then on change, we are going to put the following function, the set user input e dot target dot value and on key press call the handle key press function. The placeholder text is going to have a message and we are going to put disabled if the image is not processed as chat loading. So if we are processing the image or if we are loading the chat, we want to disable the text input functionality. Now we can also add a button like send button. So on the click, we will call the handle send message function, send the message from me, and this will be disabled again under the same conditions that the image is not processed or the chat is loading. We will also read the text. So this completes the UI. Let's save this and reload our page. Let me reload it, then select the following image, click on the process on this button, and we can see that we have the detective disease. It says here the detective disease is this. And how can we assist you? Now we can ask you the following question. Let's change the question this time. Tell me about the causes of this disease. I hit enter and now you can see a lot and here we had a response. Now I can ask it, how can I prevent this disease? The standard clicks on the button and now you can see we have received the message from the back end. The styling is done. So you can see that the user messages and the messages from the bot. This is the message from the bot. They have slightly different background than the messages sent by the user. So again, you can play around with the UI and the app or CSS file. All right, this completes our application. I hope you enjoy learning and I will see you again in the next project.
Welcome to the plant species recognition module of our AI and agriculture course. In this segment, we'll explore the captivating world of plants and how AI can be harnessed to recognize and provide in-depth knowledge about various species. Our mission in this module is straightforward but impactful. We aim to design an AI-powered system that can autonomously recognize different plant species from images, but we're not stopping at mere identification. Our system will also furnish users with detailed information about the recognized species. Behind this project lies a blend of powerful technologies. Number one, YOLO version 8 object detection. YOLO version 8 is a state-of-the-art object detection model released by Ultralytics. We've chosen YOLO version 8 because of its speed and accuracy, making it ideal for real-time applications. Number two, embed chains and OpenAI's GPT models. For the first time, we'll get hands-on experience working with the new LLM tool called Embed Chain. Embed Chain is built on top of Lane Chain, but it is much easier to use and often provides better results when using vector databases with LLMs. Number three, React JS. This JavaScript library is pivotal in creating an interactive and fluid user interface. Number four, Flask APIs. A bridge that ensures seamless communication between our user interface and the underlying logic. Let's break down the process. Number one, we start by training YOLO version 8 model on a comprehensive plant species dataset. We are using the PlantNet 300K dataset, which is open source and accessible at the given URL. Number two, once a user uploads an image, it is processed by the trained model to classify the plant species. Number three, after identifying the plant species, we find a respective Wikipedia page for this plant, utilizing it as a primary source for our language model via embed chain. Progressing further, number one, the user's interface, which is your main interaction point, is crafted using React.js. Number two, Flask APIs facilitate the smooth interaction of different system components. Here's a snapshot of our system. We'll try to ensure that the platform is easy to navigate and extract information. So why is this module crucial? The implications are manifold. Number one, the system allows for the quick identification of a vast array of plant species. Number two, it's a useful tool for students, researchers, and plant lovers offering easy access to detailed plant information. Number three, Furthermore, its utility spans biodiversity research and conservation efforts. Looking ahead, there are several ways you can take this project to the next level. Number one, add more plants. You can expand the data set by adding images of more plant species, especially those that are rare or less commonly known. Number two, update information. As new research comes out, you can update the information provided about each plant species to keep it current. Number three, field testing. If you're up for it, using the system in a real garden or forest to see how well it identifies plants in a natural setting. In conclusion, the plant species recognition module exemplifies the intersection of botany and AI, showcasing how technology can elevate our understanding of nature. As you journey through this module, immerse yourself in the learning and always remember, I'm here to support you through our course platform. Let's embark on this fascinating exploration together. Hello and welcome to the Plant Recognition Application Tutorial. This is part of our series on AI in Agriculture Lectures. In this tutorial, we will build an application where a user can upload an image of any plant and it will first detect the species of the plant using the classification model. Once we are aware of the species of the plant, we will feed it to the Lawrence Language Model and get some information about the plant using the Lawrence Language Model. Let's check this application in action. Now, this is the front end. The front end has been developed in React and the back end is in Python. We are connecting the two using Flask APIs. So we have trained a classification model, which we fine tuned on YOLO version eight on a data set of around 300,000 plants, roughly around 1,000 species. This is a very robust data set. Let's see if I can upload the image. This is an image of a plant. I upload it and click on the process button. The image is being processed now. This might take some time, not because of the classification model, but we are also feeding the output of the classification model to the large language model. As you can see here, this is the detected plant. This is the scientific name of this plant. Now, 
The large language model has automatically provided us with a basic information about the plant. It gives a brief introduction to the plant, where it is found natively, its scientific name, and its native habitat, etc, etc. It gives us some information about the plant. Let's say if we were to ask some follow-up questions regarding the plant, if I ask it the question, is it edible? So it tells us that, yes, this plant is edible. You can see that it mentions that the young stem and the leaf stalks can be cooked and eaten. The large language model is basically GPT 3.5 Turbo. Now in this application for the first time, instead of using lane chain, instead of using lane chain, we are using something called embed chain. The embed chain is built on top of lane chains with added functionalities. It works better with vector databases and providing a quick retrieval from the vector databases. Also, it is better in terms of the prompt engineering that has been done on the back end to make sure that the large language model responds from within a provided source. In this case, what we are essentially doing is we have the name of the plant from the classification model. We fetch its Wikipedia page and then feed that to the model using embed chain. Then we basically interact with the GPT 3.5 model through the embed chain API. So this is going to be a bit interesting because you are going to learn about embed chain. Let me show you the embed chain GitHub repo. This is the GitHub repository. Here you can see that they have introduced a very basic code for this library. Here it's much easier to use as compared to lane chain. We can simply initialize a bot using the app class that they have defined. You can also simply add a source that you want to use for this chatbot. Let's say a Wikipedia page or video or document. You can add anything you want. It goes with almost all input data types and you can simply use this add function as the source of your information. You do not need to create any embeddings yourself and even vector database. Also, there is no need to write the code for fetching the important information from the vector database. Embed chain handles all that for you. After doing this, you can simply run the command on bot.curie and you can pass the curie and it will give you the result. This is what we are going to use in this application. I hope that you enjoy learning embed chain in this tutorial. So let's get started. You can access this data set from the GitHub repository. Simply search PlantNet 300K on Google and open the first repository. You can download the data set from here. Here you have the data set and this is around 32 gigabytes in size. You can download this data set. Once you have downloaded it, let me check. So this is the data set right here and there is the folder. Here we have a JSON file which basically contains the mapping from the IDs inside the data set to the corresponding names of the plant. If I open the images right here, I have three folders with the names test, train, and val. So if let's say I open the train folder, you can see folders with different label IDs. So this first label ID corresponds to the images of this plant right here. You can also see all the images of the plant and so forth. The data set is already in the right format for training the YOLO version 8 classification model. In the YOLO version 8 classification model, you need three different folders named test, train, and val. And each folder should have separate folders corresponding to every class inside the data set. This subfolder would contain all the images for that class. Now let's move on to training the model. Of course, you need to first install Ultralytics. It is recommended that you create a Conda environment first, and then you can install Ultralytics using the command pip install Ultralytics. Once you are done, you can import YOLO from Ultralytics and the model will be YOLO version 8L classifier. So let's type YOLO version 8L cls.pt. You can train the model now using the command model.train. Here you can parse data equals the images folder. We can just copy the relative path of this folder and place it here. We can set some other parameters like how many epochs. So let's say we train it for 100 epochs and we can add some patience. If the model is not improving its performance for a certain number of epochs, let's say we added 10, we can also set the batch size. I'm using 128. Now I can simply run the command python yield version 8 underscore classifier dot pi. So this will start training the model and save the results in the runs folder. Once you have done training, you will simply go to the runs folder in a train folder. You will find a weights folder where you can find the best weights in your training process. You can just save these weights and come into your back end where we will be using this and performing the inference. Now that we have trained our classification model, we can move on to building the back end of our application. First, go into a folder where you want to store your code files and make it a folder for back end. Next, make an assets folder and place your weights right here, along with the JSON file containing the IDs and corresponding labels in the data set and maybe a sample image. So place these things in the assets folder and make an app.py file where you will write all the codes for your backend. Now, before writing the actual codes, 
it's important to install all the dependencies that we are going to use in application. First of all, it is recommended that you create either a code environment or maybe a virtual environment. Please also make sure that you are using Python version that is greater than or equal to 3.9 in your environment. To start the process, we will need Ultra Lytx because we need to run the inference using the classification model. Once this is done, we will install the other modules. Also, in order to install embed chain, we will use the command pip install upgrade embed chain. Now we will install the flask modules that we will use to create the flask API. So we will need flask and flask cores cross origin resource sharing. We are done here. We also need Wikipedia and Google search Python, which will be used to create the source from where we want our large language model to fetch information. So we will install Wikipedia and Google search Python. All right, now that we have everything installed, we can move on to building the code for the application. Let's test the inference model. We'll first import YOLO from Ultra Legs, then create an instance of the model. The model is in our assets folder named best.pt. Also, in order to read the label of the ID that we get, we will need to use the JSON file. We define a function called inference where we parse the image to get results. After processing the results, we can get the label and print it. Now that we have created the inference function, we can continue with integrating the large language model LLM for chat. In order to integrate the LLM, we need to import the embed chain and create an instance of the app class. Next, we can define a chat function that will use our classification model to get a label for an image, which will be the input for our chatbot. We'll stop here for now because we need to fetch the Wikipedia page and create a source of information for this chatbot. So let me create a folder. Let me check this scripts folder. Here I will create a Python file. Let's name it url.py. Then we will import Wikipedia and also import search from Google search and import search. We will now define a function get wikipedia url it will take a keyword and find a corresponding wikipedia page for this keyword so first page equals wikipedia dot page i will parse the keyword and i will return the page url if this works so return page dot url we'll add an exception condition if we get a disambiguation error or exceptions.page error, we will return none. If in case the Wikipedia page is not found, what we will do is get the URL for the first page, which appears on Google searches for your keyword on a Google search. Because of that, we'll define a function. Get Google first results. Again, this will first try to fetch the URL, so we will use the search function that we have noted. Parse it into the keyword, and we will only fetch the first result. So the number of results is going to be one. We will simply look at the result, and if it is successful, otherwise, if we stomp the iteration and can't find anything, then we will simply make a function which will basically incorporate both of them. So let's go get a relevant URL. Again, if you also take the keyword in and also this function keyword argument. Then we'll try to get the wiki URL and this will use the get Wikipedia URL function. We will parse it the keyword. If we get a wiki URL, we will return the wiki URL. Now let's try this function. I have a keyword, let's say programming, maybe artificial intelligence. So let's put the text print get relevant URL keyword. Then let's run this file, Python scripts slash URL.py. As you can see here, we got the Wikipedia page for artificial intelligence. Now we know that the function is working. So what we will do is import this function from app.py file. So we will do this. Let's put the text from scripts.url import get relevant URL. Now what we will do is put URL as equal to get relevant URL and parse the label that we have obtained from the classification model. Once we have completed that, we will add this as the source of information for the chatbot. Basically, all the content of this URL will be added as a source for this large language model. In that chain, we will make sure that the large language model will only choose what works with the Wikipedia page or the Google search page that we are providing it and it will only use that as a source of information. It will automatically handle the creation of the vector database and the searching of the relevant portion from that URL and also the query based on that. So what I will do here is create a query so that it will contain a template for the query that we are going to parse to the URL as it is the chatbot. Now we will have the template from the string. Let's put the text from string import template. Now we will add the template. So the template will be something like this botanist bot plant information service. The name is bracket name. Let's just move to the activity bracket dollar sign name. And we will ask you to please provide the following details about the plant. So we ask it, 
give a brief introduction to the plant. We will also parse it for its scientific name and let's also ask about the native habitat and the ideal growing conditions. We'll also ask what the soil type is, what sort of sunlight exposure needs, and what its water requirement is, etc, etc. Also, we can add interesting facts about the plant and its historical uses, its unique characteristics, etc. Lastly, we can add any other useful information. Alright, thank you. So, this will be the template that we will be parsing to the chatbot. Alright, now what we will do is press the info. So, let's type info equals to botanist bot dot chat. Then we will parse the first query template that we have defined and we will only substitute method in the template and parse the name variable which is labeled in our case. So let's be careful. Now what I can do is call the chat function and see what it does. Let's call it the chat function from our application, Python app.py. Oh, and I forgot one thing. We didn't add our OpenAI API key. So let's do it for now. Let me do it quickly. Let's add the opening API key. Let me add it here. This also needs to import OS. Okay, that should do. Now, let me run the Python app.py file. I should get a response from the chatbot. So we have the inference. Here we can see that a folder is automatically created called DB. Now we got an error. Okay, maybe I'm having a connection issue. Let me resolve it first. As you can see, it has created the chunks for the Wikipedia page and now it is working on getting the information. You can see here the scientific name is native habitat, the ideal growing conditions, and some interesting facts. Now our chatbot is working perfectly. We can now create the Flask API to expose the chatbot to a URL where we can connect the front end. In order to create the Flask API, we will first import the Flask model into our application. So let's put from import flask from import request and JSONify then we will import cores from flask cores. That is all about it for the API. Here we can see that we have defined a chat function. First of all, we have to define a route where we can receive the uploaded image from the front end and send back the label along with the information that we gathered from the chatbot. So let me first create the app from the Flask module. Let's add an if statement that checks if the name equals main colon, then let's add the text app.run parentheses debug equals true. Now we will create a route URL. So let's add at app.route parentheses backslash upload and the methods is going post. We will define the function upload. Okay, first of all, we will check if the user has a task to file in the API that we are receiving. So if file not in request.files. So we're done with that. We didn't see any uploaded files, so the error will be no file part. Otherwise, we have received a file. We will first of all convert the image to an open CV format. Then we will create an io.bytes.io object. For that, I need to import io.bytes.io. Then I will save the file in memory at the back end. Next, we will read the data from the file to np.from buffer. And of course, we need to import numpy as np. Here, we will parse the memory file and get value function. And we will look at the data type to be np.uint8. Then the color image block one. And the image is going to be cv2.ime encode data and the color in its flag. Now, we can call the inference function right here to get the label. So the label is going to be inference image. From there on, the flow of the application will be once a user uploads the image and clicks on the process button. We receive the image at the back end and then we classify it using our model. This happens when we call the influence function. After doing that, we will call our chatbot, which will then send that information back at the front end to display it. So what we can do is just copy the code here and paste it right here, the upload function. Okay, let me give the line indenting. All right, in addition, instead of initializing the chatbot when the app is none, we will only start it once we have received a request from the user to upload. Once the user clicks on the process button and sends us the data, what we want to do is whenever the user uploads a new image, we want to initialize a new instance of the chatbot because we don't want to mess with our data so that the chatbot might not give us information from the other plant. Let's say if the user uploads one image, gets information about it, and then uploads the second image, we don't want the data for the two plants to get mixed up. So we will initialize a new instance of the chatbot every time the user clicks on the process button. Here, we will add a 
another instance of the chat bot. So the bot in this bot that is equal to app. Let me just comment out this function because this was just for testing purposes. We will make the actual exact function quite differently. Not so differently, but with a few modifications. So let me initialize the chatbot right here. All right, what will happen now is that whenever the user uploads a new image, we read the MS, we parse it to the classifier declassification model, we read the label and parse it to the model. But first of all, we get the relevant Wikipedia page and set it as a source of information that we want our chat model to use. Now, we just need to return this information. So let's put the text return JSONify. We will return the label to the front end and the information that we have received from the chatbot in the info as well. Again, if this condition is not satisfied that we could not read the file, we simply serve return JSON file fail to process the image. Okay, now let's work on the chat function. Let's say the request is not in JSON format or there is not in request JSON. It will give an error that there was no message provided. Now we will put the data. It will put request.getJSON. Then maybe the user message from the data. Again, we can call the chat function and it will just send the user message. Let's store this. Let's put bot response and now we can simply return this as it is an object. All right, now our chat function is also done. I could delete the previous one as I don't need it any longer. Let's also get rid of this. Of course, I have to parse this new image that we have read, so let's double check everything. We have imported everything. We first initialized the Flask app. We have to set the OpenAI API key environment variable. We are reading the model and we have initialized the botanist bot available. We have read the class dictionary and we have defined the inference function. Here, we have also defined the route slash upload URL and we have defined the upload function corresponding to it. We're able to check whether the user has uploaded the file and if the file is in the correct format, we then read the file and then convert it into an OpenCV format and then we parse it to the function. We're able to get the label too and created a URL format. We made the botanist bot a global variable. We initialized the embed chain app and then we simply add the URL as a source for this chatbot. We defined the first query that we wanted to use and then we simply parsed this to the chatbot and got some information from it and then returned it. If the user sends another message, we will be dealing with it in the chat URL and this is how we will be handling it. Now our backend looks good to go. I can just save this and let me see everything up. Now we'll be working on our front end and once our front end is up and running, we can quickly test all this content and see if the backend is there as well. So that's no algorithm on the front end. In order to create the front end in React, just go over the folder where you want to write your front end code, then open the terminal in that folder and run the command npx and create React app. Let's name the app as Brandon. This will install all the modules required for this project. We might have to add some things on top of that. Now let's wait until the installation is complete. So we are done with all the installations. We can now go inside different folders and open the Visual Studio code. Let's open a new terminal here and just run the command npm start. As you can see, this is the basic React application in which they have written the boiler code by default. Let's continue building our application. The key component of the code we'll be writing in this app is the app.js file. We'll write our CSS here, but don't you worry. I will provide you with the CSS file. We don't need to worry about it that much. Basically, we'll be working with the app.js file. I will also make a few changes in the HTML file in the public folder in the index.html. Now, we are just importing the bootstraps library so that we can use it in the CSS for styling the app, but the core focus of this tutorial will be working on the app.js file, which is basically the main component of the front end application. So let's start working on the app.js file. Just in case you are using the folder that I have provided along with the front end, you just need to run the command npm install. You do not need to run the command npx create react app if you're not building it from scratch and rather use the boiler code that will be provided by us. So you'll just have to run the command npm install and it will install all the dependencies. Now, this is the app.css file that I will be working with. Yeah, so let's continue with the app.js file. And for any React app, we will first import React and the use state hook from React. Then we will also have CSS that we are going to use in both dot slash apps dot CSS and dot slash app dot JavaScript. I'll be able to define the function now. 
This function will basically return JSX at the end. The JSX is basically the HTML code that is rendered at the front end of the application. Then here, let me just add some divs right here. So let's put class name equals container empty dash five and let's add a header for our application. If you use the styling for text center, the title of the application will be plant recognition. Then let's close the H1. In this app function, we will define some states that we are going to use so that we know that we have to store the image somewhere. So we will use the image state and the set image function to separate states. Initially, it will be set to null. That leads to loading to show whether we are processing the image or not. Then we use the set loading function to set the state and initially it will be false. If we want to display any warning, we use set warning. It will be set to an empty string. If the chat is loading, i.e. we have sent the message to the backend and have it sent to the chatbot, we want to give some feedback to our user that we are processing the message that you sent. So we'll set it to false. Okay, one last thing. We will store the info and we will set the info function to set its state and it will be an empty string. All right, so let me do one more thing very quickly. Let's put the text image source here. Also, let me add this in a separate text. Let's call it left dash content. So in styling, we will adjust this content on the left side of the page. Next, maybe let's make this bold too. Before we actually run the app, we need to do one thing, export default app. Now let's put the command npm start. Here we can see the logo and the title of the app. Let's continue working on this app. First of all, we need to add a handler for the user when he uploads an image. Let's type handle image change. Then we will read the file using event.target.files bracket zero. Once the user has uploaded the image, we will now set the messages to an empty list. So let's set the user for a new image. We want to create all the previous history. We will set the info in empty string and set the detected label to null and we will start loading to false. Now we will call the div as data URL. So let's put read as data URL. This is basically the word read the file as data URL. And when this has ended loading, let's put on load end. We will set the image to reader.result. This will basically check the image for us. Now we can add the HTML for the text button for the upload image button. This is how we can do it. So we will use a conditional JSX lock. What this means is that if the image has been set to something other than null or if the statement is true, then run the following thing. Here we'll basically create our div to show the input button or preview the image. Let's say div class name equals MT-4, then set the image source as image and alternative text in case the file and parameters cannot be shortened due to some reasons. Okay, also we have to create another div on the upward button. Let me indent just like this and set the class name to MT-4. The best input type is equal to file and accept image the class name is form control file on change. We will call the handle image change function that we have defined above. Let's see how the app looks like now. As you can see, we have a choose file button. We can upload the image and let's see. If I upload the image, it gets shown right here. So the upload image functionality is working. Now we add the functionality to handle the process image button. Now I need to define first a function. Let's put data URL to blob. This will basically convert the data URL into a blog, which can be set to the backend where we will basically store it as a file and then read the data from that using OpenCV to process it. Okay, now with the mind match property from the data URL and the mind match is not true, we will throw a new error in valid mime time. Otherwise, we read the mime from the mime match and the B string from the data URL and let's get the length of the B string. So we did, so now we will create an 8-bit integer, constant enter array. Now we will write our data into this array. We can return a block from this array. All right, now we can define the handle process image event handler when the user clicks on the process MS button, the handle image. So first of all, we will set loading to true. Once the user presses the process button, it will show a loader by setting the set loading to true. We will create a blob from the data URL to blob function that we have written. 
We will pass it the image and I will create a form data and we will append the file, the blob to the form data. Now we will make an API call to the backend. So that is at the 127.0.0.1 colon 5000. I think it would be a good time to start on the backend so that we can connect the two. Now, what I can do is copy this URL and paste it right here at the route slash upload URL. So this is where we will be sending the form data. Now, let's define a method for the API call. That will be post, and this body of the API will be the form data. When we get a response, we're going to call the following function onto the response. So if the response is not okay, we throw a new error, which will say that the network response was not okay. Otherwise, return the response to JSON, and then once the response is validated on the response for JSON, we will do the following function. First of all, now the data will be containing two things, a label key and an info key, and the data corresponding to those keys. So we will set the info using data.info, and it will set the detected label using data.label. Now we will set loading to false, and we will set the messages. So the previous messages will be updated like this. The first message from the bot, the text of the message will be detected plan. And here we can substitute the data label and the second message will be again from the bot. But this time we will add the info that we have received from the bot. All right. Now we can basically handle the errors using the catch statement. Catch if there is an error, let's put console.error and we will display the image on the console. Then we'll simply set loading to false. Now let's see if everything is working. Yeah, of course. We will first have to add the JSX to render the HTML. After uploading, we want to create a button for the process image button. So class name will be button, button primary empty dash three. And on click, we're going to call the handle process image function. And maybe we will add the following text on the button process. All right. Also, in order to show the loading, we will do this. Again, we will use a conditional blob and let's create some of those. So this is the class name NT-4, then we will add a spinner. So when we are loading or processing the image, we want to show a loading screen. We are basically adding the data for that. Then let's add this text loading and a little paragraph saying image is being processed. Now we have received the selected label. Let's add a div to show class names and this will be the empty too. And we would write some text in bold and a text. And then the name of the plant, which is the detected label state, right? Just let's see what this looks like. So if I upload this element, then click the process button. Okay, let's see if it's getting any errors on the console. Let's see if we have any in. Okay, so we have gotten an error in the back end here. Yes, here. This is not uint, this is uint8. Let me say this. Okay, so now this is learning again. Now we can reload this. Let's choose a file. Click the process button. So it's working, okay? So we are back. Let's see here. You're getting the error at this line. So one more thing that we need to be sure about is what to do in the back end is that we didn't see the course policy with this app. So it's like this. And let's stop this. Choose a file. Click the process button. All right, let me look into this error. So one critical error that we were making in our backend is that we were calling the imencode function, but we have to decode it, not encode the data from the front end. After converting the encode to decode, we are able to fix this problem. Now for each message in the messages, we will call the following function so that we take the message and the index of the message and then set the key to index and the class name to message. The class name will be message, message.sender. And here we can add the message text. So message.text. Let enter is chat loading. We will write the div again. That will be right here. Next, I will create a div for this and a class with the name message loading. Let's put a space right here. Now let's go back to the page. It is not appearing on the right, so let's fix it. Okay, I see. So the problem we are facing in this block right here, rather we should have first closed this block. Let me just adjust it and place it under here. Now, like again, let's see, okay. Let me check into this issue. So the issue was we haven't enclosed all the content in this div, this app body deflects. So by doing this, it fixes our problem. 
But right now, you can see that although we can see the name of the plant as a message from the chatbot, but we don't see the info. The main reason is right here, where we are using the info state to show the information that we have received from the backend. Here we're using the info state, but the info state will only be updated when the app has rendered completely. Instead of this, we should rather do this. You should use the data.info. Now, if I save this, let's try this again. I just need to make sure. Okay, one more thing that I missed is this. I would like to try this again. As you can see, the issue has been fixed. Now we are able to see the name of the plant and the initial information that we get from the chatbot. It is time to add the functionality for allowing the user to send further messages. Let's create the handler for sending messages. So let me call it handle send message. So if user input is an empty string, we will set the warning to please enter a message and we will set a timeout to remove this warning message after 2000 milliseconds or two seconds and they will simply return. If the user message is not empty, we will set the chat loading to true. Now we create the payload as equal to message user input. Now we will make an API call to the chat URL slash chat. The method for this API call will be post and the headers for this API call will be application slash JSON, and the body will be json.stringify, parentheses payload. When we get the response from the API call, we will set the messages. Sender will be the user, and the text will be the user input. After that, we will set the chat loading to false. Then we can add the catch statements for any errors. We basically have the user input to an empty string to allow the user to enter their message again. Now, we will set the warning to an empty string too. So this creates the handler for sending messages. We can also create a handle key press in the event that the user presses the enter button. If the event key is equal to enter, we will call the handle send message function. All right, now let's write the JSX for this. If we get a warning, then the class name equals warning message, so the text will be shown here. Now, we can see the div of the input area. The input type is specified to be text. The value equals user input, and on change, what we'll do is set the user input function and set the event that the user has added. So similarly, on the handle key press and equal to handle key press, the placeholder text will be type of message, and it will be disabled if we do not have a detected label or if chat loading is true. The text for this button will be send. I hope this helps. By the way, we have just launched Augmented AI University, which is an academy for AI visionaries and innovators. So once you join Augmented AI University, you'll learn cutting edge AI, everything from computer vision to large language models, to building rag chatbots, AI in trading, edge AI, drone robotics, and generative AI. We are launching a limited time offer where you can enroll for just $12 a month and you'll gain access to all of these cutting edge courses. So click the link down below to enroll in Augmented AI University.